Hello and welcome. My name is Devin Anderson and I'm the engagement coordinator here at the American Association on Health and Disability. I'm a white woman with long dark blonde hair in uh, back and a high ponytail. I am wearing pink half frame glasses and a gray top. I am joined by my colleagues Michelle Sales and Naria Paracha who will helping out on the back end to respond any to any accessibility needs or questions you might have. Please send those along in the chat. Thank you for joining us in the third conversation in this year's Disability and Health webinar series. We are looking forward to diving into a discussion today around nutrition and disability. We know that disability is um, an important topic around, or rather nutrition rather, is an important topic around um, disability for, for everybody, of course, for everybody's wellness. When it comes to disability community, nutrition plays a more important role than ever. Whether you were born with a disability or have acquired one over your lifetime, once your body becomes a disabled one, your nutritional needs usually change too. And today we're going to hear from a panel of four experts on how important it is to understand and honor those needs as a disabled body moves through the world, through different ages and stages, and how our needs change nutritionally. It is also imperative for us to recognize that we are not speaking for the disability community as a monolith. We are only coming to this uh, as we understand it from our own knowledge and what is important for um, and what is important for you to discuss these issues with your trusted medical professionals in your lives. You know your body is the best and we want you to trust that knowledge and your team. So we will not be dispensing medical information here, just simply what, what we know as the experts. Um, Speaking of team and trusted teams, I would like to give the panelists a chance here to introduce themselves. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to get to know the panelists before we begin our afternoon together, starting with our first panelist, Robin Moore. Thank you, David. Um, my name is Robin Moore and I'm a registered dietitian. Um, I'm actually joining from South Africa this evening, you can see um, it's dark behind me. That's because it's 9 p.m. here. Um, I am a 35-year-old um, woman with uh, long black hair that's tied up. Um, I've got a purple shirt with a Peter Pan collar and gold hoop earrings. Um, so as you've been mentioned, I'm Robin Moore. I'm a, a registered dietitian. Um, I've done some research in the field of um, food and nutrition security, uh, especially in vulnerable populations like persons uh, with disabilities. And um, I recently, uh, or a few years ago, conducted a scoping review on food and nutrition security in persons with, with disabilities. And um, I'll be sharing a bit of the findings uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Robin. Looking forward to hearing more from you on that. Very interested in that topic. Um, Anthony, how about you next? Yeah, thank you, Devin. Um, my name is Anthony Alexander. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm a black man, 35 years old, um, with a uh, blue sweater on. I have brown and, and blonde locks um, and glasses. And um, I am a law graduate who's really passionate about the intersection of food and, and disability justice. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about some of the legal and policy barriers to uh, food access, especially healthy food access. Anthony, I'm always looking forward to hearing more about that. We know we do a lot with disability justice and policy, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Julia, how about you next? Sure, hi, my name is Julia Loxo. I am a white woman, uh, late 30s. I have brown hair with blonde highlights, glasses, and a black shirt. Um, I'm a, a registered dietitian as well. I currently work in the clinical sector. I have now for about 15 years um, with history through wound care, oncology, and now currently working in dialysis. Um, currently, one of the biggest struggles is helping patients secure what they need in unstable times so that they can live out their best quality of life while on dialysis. Julia, that is 
definitely important work. Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to hearing more about that as well. And Eric, how about you? More from uh, more from you. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a research scientist at the Center for Nutrition and Health Impact. I'm a 37 year old male. I have brown hair and an orange shirt. And um, I'll talk today about food security and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you so much. I love how everybody's coming from their own uh, vantage point with their own expertise. And I think we're gonna learn so much um, from all of you. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, as for all of our webinars, this event is brought to you by the American Association on Health and Disability as part of our Disability Community Engagement Partner Project, or DCEP. This initiative is working to involve the disability community in health research along with the All of Us Research Program. All of Us is an initiative to engage 1 million or more people in health research uh, to improve individualized health care for all. We will be sharing more information about all of us in the chat throughout the event today, and you can learn more and registration um, for the program will be available in the links in the chat. Um, so some housekeeping, we are recording the webinar and we'll be sharing it um, publicly after the event. We have closed captioning and ASL available as well. Please do let us know if you have any access needs or troubleshooting in the chat. We also want to remind our panelists to speak slowly for the ASL interpreters. We will be sharing also our uh, survey for evaluation midway through the webinar in the chat and in our recap email, which will be going out um, in the days after the event. Please let us know your thoughts on the series. And if you have any future topics you'd like us to cover, that's how we came up with nutrition. It was requested and now here we are. Um, the Q&A is where you should put all questions that you, uh, that you have. We are reserving the chat for accessibility needs only. So with that, I'd like to get right into the panel without any further ado. So Robin, I would like to start with you if you'd like to share your screen and get into your presentation. Um, no, I just tasted this, but no. Um, Can you see it now? Can someone just give me an indication? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, as I've mentioned, um, I'm a dietitian and I've worked in um, the field of food and nutrition security and looked specifically at people with disabilities. Um, and um, I would, I'm going to share a bit of, of the findings of a, a scoping review that was published in, in 2021 and just some updates on that. Uh, the purpose of the, of the scoping review was just to see what is known about food and nutrition security in the context of people uh, with, with disabilities. Um, mostly I'll be looking at the measures that we identified through, through the review um, and what I believe is still uh, is still lacking in in that space. Okay, so it's probably a good place to start would be to look at what what is food and nutrition security, or what do we mean by by food and nutrition security? You may have used the the concept separately, food security and nutrition security, um, but food and nutrition security is sort of a combination of the two concepts and gives it a whole new meaning. Okay, so food and nutrition security is achieved when food that is 
adequate in quantity, quality, safety, and sociocultural acceptability, is available and accessible for as well as utilized satisfactorily by all individuals at all times to live a happy and healthy life. Okay, There are four determinants of food and nutrition security. They are availability, accessibility, use and utilization, and stability. In this context, availability refers to sufficient quantities of food being available on a consistent basis. Okay, and this would be at various levels, so at the household level, regional, or national level. Accessibility implies that households and individuals within households have sufficient resources to obtain appropriate food for a nutritious diet. And to a large extent, food access is influenced by food prices and household resources. Every household has limited resources such as assets, labor, human capital, and natural resources at its disposal. At its disposal. And there are also social political factors that impact accessibility, such as social discrimination, uh, gender equality, etc. Okay. And then the use of of food is a socioeconomic aspect of, of household food security. So if you assume that a household um, has sufficient and nutritious food that is available and accessible, the households must then decide what food will be purchased, how it will be prepared, and how this food will be distrib distributed within the household. Okay, And then utilization, that refers to the ability of the human body to ingest and metabolize food. Okay, It's the result of feeding practices, food preparation, dietary diversity, and fair distribution of food within households. Stability is the temporal element of food and nutrition security, and it affects all three physical elements. So stability in also incorporates vulnerability and resilience, where vulnerability refers to the likelihood of experiencing future welfare loss, and resilience refers to the ability to recover from such a welfare loss. Okay, so um, this is, is describing food and nutrition security in general for, um, yeah, for, for anyone. Okay, and um, you can see that even if you just look at the definitions of availability, accessibility, use and utilization, and even stability, you can see that persons with, with disabilities may um, experience even more barriers at each of these determinants. When it comes to availability, accessibility, your ac accessibility um, refers to resources, uh, but we know um, for some people it may even be um, swallowing difficulties, even requesting food. So um, I know that it, it is covered in one of the later presentations, but there are additional barriers um, to food and nutrition security that are experienced by people with disabilities. Okay. Even though the fields of food and nutrition security and disability are interrelated, research on the two constructs has mostly been separate. Okay, and that's because there's a poor understanding of the of the intersectionality. There are a few um, similarities or commonalities shared between um, food and nutrition security and disability. One is that both limit life opportunities severely. Both involve key human rights and feature in the global health agenda. Food insecurity is more prevalent in households with disabilities and disabling health conditions interfere with the household's ability to provide adequate food and nutrition. So the determinants of food and nutrition security that we've mentioned, availability, um, accessibility, use and utilization, and stability, they affect all levels of social and administrative organizations. 
from the individual and the household at a micro level to the community or sub-district or district or province at the meso level and then also the national and the global level or the macro level. And food and nutrition insecurity at different social organizational levels is caused by different factors and requires specific solutions at each level. There are various instruments to assess FNS. There are different indicators of FNS and even intervention instruments of FNS. And these occur at each of the social of the social levels. Um, assessments, interventions are specific to the level um, that they are that they are to address. Um, so an intervention at the micro level wouldn't maybe be appropriate at the macro level. Okay, so in the review that we conducted, um, these were measures of, of FNS that came up in the papers that we reviewed, and then I um, added additional references since then. There was the mini nutritional assessment, or the MNA, the geriatric nutritional risk index, the subjective global assessment, or SGA, the coping strategy index, the Australian Nutrition Screening Initiative Checklist, the U.S. Household Food Security Survey Module, the Subject of Global Nutrition Assessment, the Parent Nutrition Screening Checklist, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool, the ESPEN Diagnostic Criteria for Malnutrition, Andera's Prognostic Nutritional Index, the Parent Eating and Nutrition Assessment for Children with Special Health Needs and the Arabic Parent Nutritional Assessment Scale. If I had to summarize the measures of FNS that we found in the literature, most of the measures were specifically designed for the elderly or for the general population. Only a limited number of measures were intended for people with disabilities or validated for use with people with, dis with disabilities. They are mostly completed by health professionals or in clinical settings, and they often don't provide context to the causes of food and nutrition security. Okay, so lastly, I want to just indicate where the gaps in the measures of food and nutrition security lie, where um, we require more work and more, more research. We need to be able to assess food and nutrition security at every level of social organization. Okay? The barriers to food and nutrition security, specifically for people with disabilities, are not just at the household level. A better understanding of the situation at every level informs intervention at every level. Secondly, and probably the most important for me, is that measures need to be validated for people with disabilities. Okay, People with disabilities experience unique barriers and measures that are designed for the general population aren't a true reflection of food and nutrition security in people with disabilities. And then lastly, these measures must lead to intervention. Okay, There's no point in measuring food and nutrition security if we don't have solutions to address it. The measure and the intervention must go hand in hand. Okay. So in conclusion, um, that is what's available in, in the research at the moment and where where the gaps are. Um, I have been working with a um, with the university on developing a measure that um, measures food and nutrition security in people with disabilities that is um, able to be that people can complete themselves 
that people are able to identify food and nutrition insecurity within the household that they're able to self-identify um, and and like I said, that's just addressing one of these of these gaps, but there are quite a few before we understand the full picture of what really is what is the state of, of food and nutrition security in, in people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. Your research is so well thought out and laid out, and I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, what comes of of what you're doing next um you. you're welcome thank you so much for sharing eric we'll, or sorry anthony we'll have you up next i've got your slides here and i'll be sharing All right. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm here to talk about some of the legal and policy barriers to food access for people with disabilities. And I am only going to be providing a small window into some of the barriers uh, facing people with disabilities and, and some of the issues that we have within these, these food systems. Um, there are just so many barriers that that I could have a week long conference on on just the legal policy barriers alone. But, um, you know, I wanna start out by talking about some of the federal agencies and departments that are focused on food. Um, our federal system is just so large. We have 400, over 400 federal agencies, departments and sub agencies. Um, but the two agencies that I think are, are really important to bring up that that uh, focus on food are the USDA, which is the US Department of Agriculture and the US Department of Health and Human Services. And I know a lot of you might know of HHS from just some of the programs that they have that are directly targeted to supporting people with disabilities, um, but they also house um, some, some food related um, programs that in agencies, I should say. Um, so the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that's housed under HHS, and they're responsible for um, researching food-related illnesses, investigating health outbreaks, trying to prevent and stop any health outbreaks and illnesses from happening. The USDA um, is tasked with regulating or focusing on um, uh, milk products, poultry, which would be chicken, turkeys, uh, geese, um, and egg products. And then the FDA, which is under HHS, um, is responsible for all other products that the USDA doesn't cover, like um, your dairy, your produce, your fruits, your spices, your nuts. Um, and so that, that gives you an idea of some of the federal agencies. You can go to the next slide. Um, so some of the, the general issues that these, um, agencies and departments, um, uh, deal with on a daily basis are, uh, a lot of advocates would argue that they are underfunded, the staff are overworked, um, the documents that they produce, the guidelines that they produce, um, is just extremely lengthy and has some confusing, complex language. And just the way that they're they're set up, they're they're so massive that it's really confusing to not only the general public but even sometimes people who work within these very various organizations, these various departments and agencies. Um, so, as an example, just the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, 
which as I said earlier, is a, a, one of the departments within HHS. So the Food and Drug Administration, as the name implies, um, regulates pharmaceutical drugs, medical drugs, and food. Um, but there are just over 2,600 um, brand name medical drug makers in the U.S. alone. And the workers, the staff, are, are tasked with uh, regulating all of these these drug makers um, in the U.S., as well as any drug makers outside of the U.S. that are selling medical drugs within the U.S. to, to U.S. consumers. Um, but they just do not have the staff to be able to do this in a, a, a timely manner, um, in a, a time frame that would be ideal for everybody. Um, and because of this, a lot of people would argue that there's just so much focus on the drug aspect of the, the FDA that a lot of the food related issues just get kind of pushed aside and uh, aren't aren't really given the attention that they should be given attention to. Um, and this is really important because we all need to eat. Food, food impacts all of us. We need a healthy food system. So that's not good if they're unable to um, really devote as much attention as, as they should to food related issues. Um, and then again, uh, the guidance that these uh, departments like the FDA produce can just sometimes be hundreds and hundreds of pages long, um, might utilize language that um, maybe policymakers understand or um, some of the experts who have helped draft some of the, the guidelines, but to everyday people who are gonna be impacted um, and wanna know about what their guidance is on, on say produce or something like that, it's, gonna, it's just too confusing to read and too, too time consuming to read. Um, and then just with respect to the way that they're structured, um, F the FDA, again, as an example, they have nine center level organizations and 13 headquarter offices. And I, I just think with this many people, it can sometimes get confusing over who's responsible for a particular issue area, or there just might be, um, unfortunately, some internal conflict between different offices. Maybe one office might want to focus on a, uh, a, a particular issue area that they know that the other office is responsible for. Um, and there's just kind of some infighting going on. Um, but you can kind of see how this um, can, can uh, probably play out into uh, food access for um, uh, for people with disabilities. When you have organizations that are underfunded um, and staff that are overworked, because these these programs like the USDA, they're responsible, they're tasked with um, uh, covering programs that, um, uh, that provide food access to people with disabilities. So if they're underfunded, then that can, can in turn create issues. And then it also impacts food safety. Um, Many of you might remember at the beginning of the pandemic in 2021, um, there were issues with baby formula, but it took about five months for um, FDA to actually make a recall because of that. Um, and that probably is due in, in large part because of some of these issues that I just mentioned. You could go to the next slide. Um, so food access areas, uh, food access barriers, excuse me, um, just some more, more food access barriers. Um, again, I can't really talk about every piece of legislation that's important, but, um, I, I think it's important to talk about some of the major ones like the farm bill. The farm bill, uh, is updated by Congress. It's supposed to be updated every five years. Sometimes it, it takes a little longer, but it's typically updated about every five years. And one of the issues that um, can come into play with the farm bill is that you might have lawmakers who are just focused on cutting spending and eliminating um, any of our um, federal debts. And um, when they are so focused on 
uh, creating cuts to, to legislation that can impact um, some of these programs that are, are designed to uh, eliminate food insecurity. Uh, so as an example, in 2020, the average SNAP recipient received about $4 per day for food, which is just mind boggling to me. Um, you are able to, uh, applicants are able to apply to multiple programs, but there are issues with that. Um, each program oftentimes has its own application. Um, so this can just be overwhelming for people, you know, especially if they have um, certain disabilities where, you know, this is just really, really difficult in terms of their, just due to their visual or, or motor disabilities. Um, and uh, I think oftentimes they're just un unintended consequences with moving um, a lot of these applications online only. Um, people forget that a lot of Americans, millions of Americans are um, uh, still, uh, uh, still lack access to um, the internet. And um, so having, having applications that are web only can, can have its own limitations. Um, the websites themselves can have poor design features that are inaccessible to people's disabilities. Um, and then the programs themselves can create barriers for people with disabilities. Uh, one of the, the laws that people often talk about are, uh, is, is the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996. This kind of created a lot of the um, work requirements that we see today in some of these programs. Uh, there are exceptions that are, are carved out for certain people, like uh, pregnant people, elders, um, uh, people with disabilities, but not everybody has a disability that has been formally diagnosed. And so this can create issues where, you know, they might have a disability, but it's just not, it's not been diagnosed by a professional doctor. And, you know, what does that mean for them having to uh, complete some of these um, work requirements that can, can create some issues. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about how state and local governments can impact food access as well, um, because that they can play a huge role, not just our, our, our federal government. State governments are tasked with uh, zoning, although oftentimes they uh, delegate this process to local governments. Um, so state and local governments can play a huge role in zoning. And what I mean by zoning is just, um, you know, setting aside certain areas within um, neighborhoods for residential only, for homes only, for commercial spaces, which would be like your offices or mixed use, which can be land that can be used for both. Now, sometimes zoning um, does not allow certain spaces to be used. Um, I have community gardens as an example. Community gardens might only be allowed in, in land that's, that's zoned only for um, residential spaces and not for commercial spaces. And uh, I think one of the ways that we can increase food access for people with disabilities, especially when um, some of these programs within the federal government are, are um, underfunded, you know, you can, you can kind of create physical spaces within local communities and having community gardens. But what that means is, is pushing your city council members, your state elected leaders to um, reform their, their zoning laws to make sure that spaces like these community gardens are um, allowed in more places. Food donations. Um, this is another issue um, that can impact food access in, in which state and local governments can play a big role. Um, oftentimes, state and local governments uh, are are tasked with setting laws that, um, I hope I'm doing well on time, I don't see my timer, uh, are, are uh, tasked with laws for food safety, 
um, that are meant to protect the public health, but this can have some unintended consequences that that um, scares people from possibly donating food. At the federal level, there are some laws like the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act and the Food Donation Improvement Act that um, uh, are designed to um, uh, prevent people from um, being afraid of legal liability if they donate food, but state and local governments can uh, pass the same laws at, at um, the state and local level and also encourage um, food banks to um, uh, supply um, uh, their, their consumers with healthier food options, and they can provide incentives for doing that. Uh, and that leads me into this last bullet point um, where you can just create policies uh, or promote programs that push retailers to stock healthy food and become more accessible. Um, a lot of areas are in rural communities or um, even urban communities that um, do not have access to uh, grocery stores and some of the, the community members get their um, foods from corner stores and stuff like that. But state and local governments can step in and come up with, with programs that provide financial incentives to um, uh, ensure that some of these smaller convenience stores and corner stores um, uh, are stocked with healthier foods. Um, and and um, also ensuring that they you know, just have money to update their, their stores to make them more accessible. Um, and, you know, again, I, I couldn't really talk about all of the barriers. There are plenty of other barriers. Um, there are, um, you know, school, school nutrition laws that exist. Um, and, you know, those can, those can also have some unintended consequences, like, um, you know, just free and reduced um, lunch programs for students, for example. Um, but a lot of advocates are, are pushing for just free and, and reduced lunch programs for everybody um, to, to kind of reduce the stigma for kids um, so that that kids who are low income um, just, just don't feel stigmatized by only uh, being able to um, you know, just by making it obvious that they're the ones who are in need of, of, of receiving these services. Um, there's also a lot that can be done. Do you want to uh, go to the next? There's, there's also a lot that can be done, um, you know, just with mutual aid. I was involved with Aut Autistic People of Color Fund, which has done uh, great work in, um, providing uh, money to food insecure people. I've been involved in the past with an organization here in Los Angeles where I'm located called the uh, Burrito Project, which just hands out food for uh, food insecure people. Um, so I just really encourage people to um, research some uh, food policy programs and organizations at the local level where they can kind of help in getting support either for themselves and others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. I am such a huge proponent of helping out locally, mutual aid. I know a lot of folks on our team are as well. So I love that shout out for mutual aid. Very important. Um, great. Let me figure out how to stop this. All right, sorry about that. Timer gave us a little sound, a little sound effect there, which was lovely and also unnecessary. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to Julia, who will be presenting next. 
pull up her slides. Okay, so hi, I'm Julia. I am a registered dietitian and I wanted to focus today on nutrition wellness. Next slide. So today we'll go ahead and talk about meeting nutritional needs and why it's important, ways it helps, uh, barriers to meeting nutritional needs. I tried to pick some topics that aren't often discussed like medication interactions and also the villainization within the wellness industry. And then finally, we'll end with what is the true meaning of wellness for you? Next slide. So meeting nutritional needs, why is it important? Um, your, it's, your nutrients are the fuel for your body. Uh, in, they cascade into so many other awesome ways like nerve conduction, they control your electrolyte management, they help your bones stay strong and your muscles, they help with wound healing, um, nutrients also can support your immunity and reduce healing time, and most importantly, they aid in symptom management. So we'll go ahead and talk about that specifically. Next slide. So, um, nutrition can help alleviate and exacerbate symptoms. I want to take a moment here to make sure to point out that the symptoms burdening you need to be discussed with your physician and your care team. Um, once the cause of those symptoms or the etiology of those symptoms are determined, it's a lot easier than to put out a prescribed diet or what we would call a therapeutic diet in order to help alleviate some of the symptoms. So I just wanna put out that the next two slides do not serve as medical advice, but they can help perhaps in a conversation with your physician and care team. Next slide. So just some of the various ways um, nutrition and the control of your nutrients may be able to help if you're experiencing swelling or edema. Oftentimes we look first and foremost at sodium intake to help with that. And, and depending on the etiology of this, the swelling, where it's coming from, why it's happening, um, looking at fluid intake may also be really important to even restricting it. Headaches, um, one of the things that's often overlooked in headaches is artificial sweeteners and sugar alcohols in our food. Um, hydration, first and foremost, um, is a really important one too. I like to approach nutrition from a much gentler perspective here. So when we talk about proper hydration, I know there are people who do not like to drink water all day, every day, and that's okay. Uh, milk can be hydrating. Coffee can even be hydrating, believe it or not. Believe it or not, juice, things like that. If you're worried about sugar, you're worried about calories, it's good to keep in mind, but be gentle with yourself. You don't wanna drink all the water all day long you can mix it up a little bit and still be hydrated. Gastrointestinal distress. Um, a lot of times we're looking here at high fiber foods, what's sometimes called roughage, things like that. Um, maybe easing back on that a little bit. I love a vegetable. I'm gonna tell you all day long, teach your vegetables, but sometimes we have to rein it in a little bit. Uh, greasy foods and sugar alcohols can also cause some GI distress. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. Thanks. So uh, moving on with muscle cramping, again, we're going to talk about hydration here and maybe potassium and magnesium. Um, those would be good discussions with your doctor if you're in, in experiencing something like that. Um, for POTS, 
a lot of times we're adding back in sodium. I love to use the a pickle a day, um, a pickle spear a day often gives a really good amount of sodium to help with some of those symptoms. And finally, um, Crohn's gastroparesis, diverticulitis and colitis really used to be given like a blanket statement of a list of foods that you were supposed to avoid, but now it's so, so personal and individual um, in determining the flare inducing foods that you have to kind of trial and error and experiment and figure out what works best for you. Next slide. So I wanted to talk to you about how else we can meet our nutritional needs. Um, utilizing processed foods, and I know when I, I use the word processed foods, everybody um, gets a little nervous about that, but processed food simply means that it's manipulated in some way. Um, our society has done a pretty good job of lumping it into the category with Twinkies, but it simply can mean pre-diced, pre-cut veggies, fruit, pre-washed greens. Um, we can take a good look at proteins that are already prepared, um, chicken, canned tuna, beans. Sometimes these come with a sodium concern. Um, canned beans can be rinsed in a colander and sodium can be reduced. Uh, we shouldn't overlook either protein powders or mass gain powders if weight gain might be a concern. Um, microwavable rices, grain pouches, um, if they're flavored, they don't usually have added sodium, but sodium can be a concern with the flavored rice pouches. Finally, there's frozen and steamable veggies, um, grains. Again, sodium is a huge concern sometimes with the, the frozen aspects if there's a sauce, um, even a light sauce. So just be aware of that. Um, if food prep is challenging, there are food choppers, one-handed cutting boards. Um, even to reduce risk, we might suggest nylon knives. Next slide. So what are some barriers to meeting nutritional needs? Um, we'll look at medication interactions and we'll also then talk about um, the wellness industry and things that might be villainized that are otherwise useful tools. Next slide. So again, I wanna say um, this does not cover any type of medical advice. This may help if somebody's taking this medication and they need to have a conversation with their medical provider or their care team. So medications compete for absorption in the gut with food. And a lot of times the food wins and the medication doesn't get absorbed the way it's supposed to. So it reduces its effectiveness. Um, so some of the ways this happens, diuretics can deplete magnesium and potassium. Calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors will deplete potassium. Um, some things just require a stable intake in order for the, the, the med to be absorbed and, absorbed and utilized the way it's supposed to be. Um, lithium requires a stable sodium intake and Coumadin requires a stable vitamin K intake. No sudden changes, meaning don't gobble down a huge spinach salad for three days in a row, and then the next day, none of it at all. You try to keep your intakes as stable as possible to help the medicine work the best it can. And um, antibiotics can... Flora. Next slide. So one of the things I tend to feel pretty passionate about is the wellness industry and how it uses food um, labeling and jargon and can often be kind of hurtful sometimes. Um, processed foods can be incredible tools to help us consume nutrient-dense foods um, when we need a little more and even when we don't. Um, but they're often villainized. Like I said, you, you would think I'm talking about Twinkies, but all I'm talking about is pre-washed greens in order to make mealtime a little bit easier for you. Um, the thing I want to put out into the world is that um, some people feel pretty passionate about judging the way other people utilize these tools. 
as a dietitian, the way I see it, if you're going for pre-cut veggies and that's how you're getting your veggies for the day, I'm thinking nothing else but like celebrating in my head that you're eating veggies. 90% of Americans do not get the recommended daily vegetable intake. 80% of Americans don't get the daily fruit intake recommendation. They don't hit the numbers. So however you're hitting your numbers is amazing and should be worth celebrating. Um, the stigma of utilizing some of these processed foods, these pre-cut items, these things that help nourish yourself are not lazy. Um, you're not cutting corners. There's absolutely nothing wrong and utilizing these tools is a complete power move. I think it's important too that we put our blinders on and our earmuffs on. A lot of times when we hear messages from the wellness industry that talk very shameful about some of these food choices, I think the messages target the vulnerable population who oftentimes feels let down by the traditional medicine avenues and they're just looking to feel well. Oftentimes there's ableist messaging. A lot of times there's elitist messaging. You only reap the benefits if you're already well. You already reap the benefits if you can afford them. Um, so I just want to send the message out into the world that it is okay that you choose what's best for you in order to get what you need to fuel your body and to take care of yourself. Next slide. So with that comes, what is our personal definition of wellness? I think it's really important to reflect on and understand that it's really personal. It's really nuanced, but as a dietitian and maybe I'm biased, I think it often comes with nourishment and how you take care of yourself and all of the rest cascades out from there. Utilizing processed foods and helpful tools is absolutely not shameful. It's working smarter, it's not working harder, that's okay. Um, the other thing I like to repeat to myself, the mantra is fed is best. How are you feeding yourself? However you're feeding yourself is okay. Um, in a world where we hear extreme messages all day long about all of our personal choices, seems like everybody has an opinion, it's really okay to approach it in such a gentle way. Remember who you are, what you need, and how you can best provide that for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Appreciate your messaging. I agree, if fed is best. And I'm so glad I ate lunch beforehand because I'm feeling a little hungry now that I heard all that presentation. Um, and next we'll move over to Eric. Give me one second to pull up his slides. All right. Well, thanks everyone for being on today. And I know we're coming up to the end um, so I can go a little bit faster through this. But, you know, basically, like I mentioned earlier, I'll talk about food security and a little bit about considerations uh, among people with intellectual dis and um, developmental disabilities and then introduce you to a research project that um, we are starting up right now. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, this just shows our research team if you're interested. Um, and then also, I just need to acknowledge the study I'm going to describe later is um, funded by a C grant from USDA NEFA. And then if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so I did want to, you know, briefly introduce the topics of food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. Um, Robin already gave a really great in-depth review earlier, so I don't we don't need to spend too much time here. Basically, you know, these two concepts are about quantity and quality. So Food security is about not being able to get enough food and nutrition security or insecurity is about not being able to get healthy food. Um, and for the rest of the talk though, I'll mainly be focusing on food security or food insecurity, which is when a household um, has issues with getting enough food. If you wanna go to the next slide. 
Um, food insecurity is important because it's associated with increased risk of poor health. And um, you can see some of the health issues here that are associated with food insecurity. These are all some of the main causes of mortality in the US. And then the next slide. Um, this is a mechanistic pathway just showing how food insecurity impacts health. And basically what it's describing is that food insecurity increases stress. It increases um, people needing to engage in coping behaviors like foregoing medication to be able to afford food and compromises to dietary quality because of you know a varied and healthy diet is often more expensive than a less helpful diet. Um, then next slide. So food insecurity is measured using USDA's Household Food Security Survey module, at least in the US. I know Robin was kind of giving you guys more of a global context earlier. Um, it, in the US, USDA's uh, module is 18 item survey module. It's widely used in research. It's considered the gold standard. And it's also um, formally used in um, government public health surveillance. Um, like the, the current population survey. So it's used all the time to track how well we're doing as a country in terms of food security. Um, but it mainly focuses on inability to access food due to not having enough money. Uh, and that's, you know, a major reason why people can't get enough food. Um, but it's not the only one. Uh, also, some populations, you know, like people who have disabilities, for example, um, there's not enough known in the scientific literature about how food insecurity might be experienced differently or different risk factors across various groups. And so if it is different, then maybe the way that we measure it and address it for various populations needs to be different or tailored as well. And then next slide. Um, so we do know that households who report at least one person with a disability um, those households has a, have up to twice the food insecurity rate as other households. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, additional issues that could affect food access among people with disabilities that goes beyond just not having enough money. Um, and then getting a little bit more specific to people with intellectual and, and developmental disabilities or IDD. If you see that IDD, that's what that's referring to in these slides. Um, and that's, that's people who have cognitive and functional limitations that start before the age of 18. And this group has much higher odds for experiencing food insecurity than um, people who do not have IDD. Then if you wanna go to the next slide. So um, people with IDD are a varied group and they face a number of the following issues that are related to food access. So differences in intellectual functioning or intelligence and including sometimes physical differences in functioning, um, they can be more likely to be unemployed or experience poverty. They can face structural barriers to accessing um, governmental assistance programs like some of the uh, programs Anthony mentioned earlier and can have um, challenges with shopping for um, food or safely preparing and storing food. Aside from the economic issues, the rest of these are not really considered in current survey measurement tools or approaches for addressing food security. And then if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, that the study I mentioned earlier, um, we wanna accomplish these two objectives. So one is to interview people with IDD and if applicable, their family and parents or guardians to understand um, the food insecurity experience of people with IDD. Um, so we want to know, you know, what are the main risk factors? What are the issues? What are the challenges? And what are the strengths? And then in objective two, we want to develop a preliminary prototype of a survey measurement tool tailored for this population um, and a guidance document that we hope organizations can use to better understand food insecurity among this population and look for ways they can intervene. We also have an advisory board um, overseeing this project that's made up of um, people with IDD, family members of someone with IDD, and also academics who work in the disabilities or food security space. And also, I mentioned um, earlier, I believe that if you look in the bottom right corner, we're actively recruiting interviewees right now. So if you are interested or you know someone who might be, who um, has IDD or has a family member who has IDD, um, 
or anyone who works in the space who can get the word out. Um, you can use the QR code at the bottom there of the screen um, to find the enrollment form and um, it'll, it'll be there. I think uh, we can probably just in the interest of time, skip to the last slide. That might be the best and we don't need to go into detail of the study. Um, but um, basically if you do wanna learn more, um, it, at the very last slide will be the, you can look at these slides afterwards if you're interested in kind of the steps for this study. But the very last slide, if you have any questions about the study or wanna learn more, um, if you go one more slide, Devin, um, you'll see our um, email address for the study. So it's ifidd at centerfornutrition.org. And there's also a QR code there for a website for the study if you want to learn a little bit more on the left side. And then again, that QR code on the bottom right. If you're interested in being an interviewee or know someone who might be, um, please uh, go there and you can uh, uh, enroll in the study. And thank you very much for your time. I almost got us right to two. I was one minute over, but thanks. I mean, technically on my end, you still have four minutes. So if you still want to talk more about the study, you have you have a captive audience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who yeah. wants to stay over, yeah, that'd be totally fine if you want to. Oh no, this goes until three. We have another half an hour yet for everything. Oh, so okay. Still... Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry, I thought I was trying to get us to two. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, let's let's back up then, if that's okay. I can just go over the study. I think it's going to be really sure. interesting. Um, basically, I had you know on slide ten is a study timeline, and uh, it's a two year project. And um, just want to kind of flip through it just to give you kind of an idea of what we're working on. Some of the things, you know, that Robin mentioned earlier, um, and it sounds like we have a lot of overlap in some of the things we're working on. Um, you know, we're working on the same things, but, but in the U.S. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, we're in the early stages. Um, these are the first steps we've accomplished so far. So we've assembled our advisory group. We've met with them already to kind of talk about the study and get some guidance and um, gone through the interview guides with them. So those are all ready to go and um, we're ready to start interviewing. And then the next slide will kind of show you the next step um, where we're going to be conducting interviews throughout the, the winter and spring. And then we'll be analyzing the data. We hope to speak to up to 30 people with IDD and or family members or guardians, if applicable, um, from across the country. Um, and we'll be disseminating the early qualitative findings in the scientific literature and also plain language versions of the findings. Uh, then the next step um, will be um, working with the advisory group to take those qualitative interview findings and use them to inform a prototype version of a survey measurement tool tailored for this population and uh, a guidance document as well. And so we hope the guidance document will be helpful both for um, organizations that work with people with IDD, um, but don't know much about food insecurity and also organizations that work with food insecure people, but don't know much about IDD. And um, so we hope it'll help them kind of understand food insecurity, what it looks like in this population and inform ways that they can be helpful. Um, and then the, you know, the last step is reporting out the final findings. And again, we will do that to a scientific audience in plain language version. Um, then if you want to just jump ahead, like two slides, the, this is a, a seed funded project. And so kind of the idea is that we're going to um, create something that could grow into a larger, more impactful project. Um, so we plan to take the, the products of this study, which will be preliminary, and apply for additional support from USDA so that we can do things like psychometric testing of the measure, um, piloting some intervention approaches that, that um, get brainstormed during that phase where we're working with the, with the advisory group, um, and collect more feedback on the tools and, and refine and finalize them. So those are kind of our next steps. Um, yeah, so that that's all for me, I hope. Uh, um, you, that, that was helpful, and um, thanks for letting me kind of explain that study to you guys. And if you're interested in getting involved, this slide here will show you how. So thanks so much for your time. 
Thank you so much, Eric. I hope that folks are interested in the study. I know that I think it's fascinating. Anytime we have a chance to talk about um, research, I am all about it. And that's the perfect segue to talk about research. Right, I think I stopped sharing is perfect. Because now we're going to talk um, right before the q and A. I I want to talk real quickly about our All of Us Research Program um, and how that connects directly with our conversation um, today. So All of Us Research Program is an, an initiative from the National Institutes of Health to create the country's largest and most diverse health research database with the goal of reaching 1 million or more people over a 10 year span. Um, as of yesterday, we got some new numbers out and um, 847,418 people have joined the program. So we're gonna smash that million person mark uh, probably by the end of summer, I would imagine. Um, more than 80% of those uh, folks are from groups that have been underrepresented in health research in the past and over 30% of those identify as living with a disability. And um, that is the ultimate goal of the program is to ensure that those folks who are historically underrepresented, so we're talking racial minorities, um, sexual and gender minorities, those living in rural areas and disabled communities, of course, from, from all walks of life are being included in health research. Um, also, there are 1,000 institutions registered to do this work with over 14,324 researchers doing the work um, as we speak. So uh, you can learn more about the research uh, currently underway with all of us um, at the link in the chat below. Um, and last year, a little special mention, since we're talking about re uh, nutrition, uh, last year, all of us launched a special nutrition for precision health study that involves a few thousand all of us participants and we're going to link um, initiatives, we'll link rather the initiatives in the chat uh, to that as well. And I do believe, I just received word, that that will be on uh, CBS News this weekend. So there's going to be a feature on that um, in the media this week. So that's exciting too. So um, I would like uh, to bring on um, Nerea to help with some of the Q&A We've got some great questions happening in the Q&A, in the chat. We've already got some questions from our registration link that we send out beforehand. So I, um, I welcome all the panelists back on board as well um, as we sort of continue the conversation led by, led by you. Thanks, Devin. My name is Nuria Paracha. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a South Asian woman wearing all black and I have medium length black hair. So just going in from the Q&A right now, we have um, about eight questions. And like Devin mentioned, we also have some other questions that people had submitted prior to this. So we'll get to those as well. So apologies if I mispronounce any names and I'm gonna try and summarize the questions as quickly as I can. So the panelists have access to the Q&A so I'll pretty much just read a quick general summary and then the question, but they do have that extra context that I might not be reading again, just in the interest of time. So the first question from um, Margie Gray, I would like to hear thoughts on conflicting nutritional needs. I have chronic low sodium, but also high blood pressure. Um, I limit water, but have been dehydrated and I struggle to find things to eat. So it kind of sounds like, you know, on these nutritional needs, what's an answer for that? Oh, sorry. Is there, is there a way I can see that a little more specific, the question specifically? Yeah, I think you should be able to, on the bottom, you should click on Q&A, and then you should be able to see these questions in there. But if not, I can message it to you. I don't know why I don't see, see that one specifically. Oh, um, well, I can see some of them, but not that one specifically. Let me go ahead and, um, Julia, I'll just message that to you right now if you want to go ahead and answer that. Just message it okay. to you. And, like, answer it in a message back or, like... Well, if you if you feel like you can answer it, anyone can answer it. This is so all these questions, unless specifically mentioned, anyone can answer them. If you have anything that you want to state back to that, and I'll just click answer it live. I 
I'm so sorry. I still can't even see anywhere where it is. So I'll just verbally repeat the whole thing again so everyone has that context. I would like to hear sorry. thoughts on conflicting nutritional needs. I have chronic low sodium but also high blood pressure. I limit water but have been dehydrated. I struggle to find things to eat. Man, well, that, I mean, that's tough. That's a tough one. I empathize with how to even go about that. Um, I have patients in similar situations. And when we work together with a physician or the care team, the first thing we ask is what is the priority? Is, the, is there a condition where the priority therapeutic diet will take over and then the rest needs to kind of be followed so the cascade kind of happens from there? Um, that's a really tough one to answer without also giving like blatant like medical advice, I think. Um, but I would definitely suggest asking what the priority is in the care treatment. Great, thank you so much. If no one has anything else, I'll go ahead and go to the next question. So Meg Tracy had a question for Robin. Um, so essentially they stated, did you see similar concepts? Oh, cool. actually, let me read the previous. Um, wonderful study, great constructs and definitions. Thank you for exploring these using an intersectional approach. The right to healthy, culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods to define our own food and agricultural methods. So that was a quote. Did you see similar concepts in your study or how do you understand food sovereignty within your study and work to address gaps in FNS? And then she posted a link, www.fastblackfeet.org. Or www Robin, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I had a look at it and interestingly it was actually um the feedback that we got from from the paper um from one of the one of the critical readers was um in the future to to consider the concept of food sovereignty so it wasn't something that I had included even as a search term um in in the paper but it was brought up that 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 was possibly missing. But I think it speaks a lot to just looking at how broad this concept of, of food and nutrition security is, and that we've sometimes limited it to just, does the person have enough food to eat? But there's so much more to it um, to consider a household or an individual to be food and nutrition secure. Um, and it's an important aspect looking at the cultural acceptability of food. And it's not just about volume of, you know, is there, is there food? Um, so it's a really important topic. It's not something that I've explored um, much myself, but but it is something that going forward I've been advised to look at. But yeah, it I think it just it just shows again, like I said, how how broad the the topic is and how many things there are that determine um, whether an individual or or a household or even at at again if you look at those various levels, this speaks to the meso level and the macro level as well. Thank you. All right, thank you for that response, Robin. I'll go ahead and jump to the next question. I saw that there are some comments, but just for the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the comments and just go to a question. So um, from again, Meg Tracy had a question for Anthony. As a part of a public health partner in Montana, starting in 2000, we began working closely with people with IDD, HCBS service providers and the commodities program to increase access and use of commodities to support healthy nutrition for people with IDD. However, one year ago, USDA told Montana that persons with IDD are not eligible for commodities. This has significantly impacted people's budgets and opportunities. Do you have insights to this change and what and what we can connect people with resources for their health meal planning like commodities did? Sorry, I was on mute. I actually do not, um, but if you know, my, my contact information can be shared. I can definitely connect you to some, some people who would be able to answer that.
Okay, great. Thank you so much. And just as a reminder, I know we're getting a lot of questions in the chat and Q&A. We will be sending follow-up resources and remediated and accessible PowerPoints and relevant links that have been mentioned. So those will be sent through email and then we will create a resource page within the following week. So you can expect accessible um, and accurate copies through email. So it's gonna be the email that you use to register for this webinar. And then as time goes on, we'll have an accessible resource page for this webinar. So do not worry about anything that we're mentioning, you will get access to that. Um, the last question in the chat, I know that some of the, um, oh, actually, I think all of those were answered. So Devin, if you just wanna go ahead and jump to um, the questions that we had selected prior, or if you have a, a, a different kind of scope of what yeah. you wanna do right now, thanks so much. No, that's fine. Thank you so much, Naria, for your help with that. Um, I We have a couple here. Um, where can, um, besides the medical, um, their medical providers, um, how can we navigate discussions about nutrition? while being mindful of issues like fat phobia and its impact on people with disabilities, especially by and with doctors. If anybody wants to take that one on. Can you repeat it one more time? Yes. Um, how can we navigate discussions around nutrition while being mindful of issues like fat phobia and its impact on people with disabilities, especially when those conversations are happening with, uh, with doctors and medical professionals? I... You know, this this isn't the nutrition aspect isn't my expertise, just having come from like the law and policy. But I do know that, you know, there is is certainly power in numbers and um, social media has really been um, influential in kind of um, breaking down these barriers for people with disabilities and calling out, you know, some of the. Um, interpersonal and structural racism within and 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 bigotry within, including fat phobia within the healthcare system. And I think if if more people are able to kind of document their experiences online um, and call out some of their medical professionals who are um, maybe making comments that are are insensitive, I think that goes a long way. And just collectively. Um, making it known that that that's just not okay. That's all I would add. Julie, did you have something to add? I was kind of mulling it over. I also yeah. am having some really severe Wi-Fi technical issues. I still didn't even hear the full question when you repeated. That's Sorry. okay. No, you're okay. Um, but um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll move on to another one just in the interest of time. Um, and we will be, I think Naria mentioned this too, we will be also creating a resource page. So we will get to some of these also um, on that because there are some really good ones that we're just not going to be able to get to here. Um, do you have suggestions for um, overcoming disability-related food problems like picky eating, sensory issues, and food intolerance. So any suggestions on that as it relates to folks with disabilities? Yeah, I, um, there's, there's wonderful ways to, um, adjust environment that helps create a comfortable environment in the first place um, that makes things a little less scary if you're trying new textures or something that perhaps has frightened in the past and maybe created a food aversion. Um, trying to introduce the food again in 
a gentle way if that is acceptable. Um, but first and foremost, making sure the environment itself is really right for that moment. Um, do, do we need sitting? Are we sharing it with friends? Is it a comfortable environment? Is the texture appealing? Um, is the smell appealing? Creating all the ways that it's the most positive uh, introduction of a food or an aversion of some kind, um, especially with our picky eaters or people who have sensory or texture issues. Um, don't force it. If it's not comfortable, it's not comfortable. Keep it as comfortable as possible. Meals are supposed to be as happy and enjoyable as possible. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and that's okay. Where were you when my toddlers were eating things? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that would have been so helpful. No. <laughs> um, and just for everybody um, on the panel, um, just kind of one last um, poll. If you, um, you know, and if there's anything that you, um, any recommendations you folks have on, um, if there's many people with disabilities have conditions or genetics that impact ability to extract nutrients from food. Um, is there any recommendations you could give on what they can eat, how they should be speaking with their doctors on that, um, anything with access, anything they should be looking for in that? So, um... So this is vast. Basically, as long as your gastrointestinal tract is, you have various places where very specific nutrients are absorbed throughout. So depending, it's a hard question to answer because depending on what you're malabsorbing might mean that specific part of your GI tract is also having an issue. So without understanding really, you know, a specific nutrient or a specific um, missing link, that can be kind of a hard one to answer. But of course, I think ex exploring the discussion with your doctor of, okay, I just noticed these symptoms. I'm wondering if it's because I'm lacking X, Y, Z. And I know that my physical anatomy means that I'm not utilizing what I'm intaking. Um, asking for supplementation recommendations are best here because then they also come in various ways that they're absorbed, whether that be liquid, under the tongue, uh, things like that. And so getting the recommendation from the person that first and foremost knows your specific anatomy, what you need to be absorbed is a great discussion to start with. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming and sharing this space with us today. Um, uh, sorry, there was one more in the Q&A that I saw, but I think it disappeared. Let me just double check real quick. Um, yes, we'll answer that. Sorry about that. Uh, so thank, again, thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. And to those in the audience, thank you for your attention and these thorough questions. We will be creating um, a website link with some more Q&A resources for you all. Um, we will be doing the recording. Um, we'll be making sure the captions are correct and all of that will be out fully as well, along with the slides from the panelists. Um, so you'll have access to all of that as well. Um, we cannot do this work without all of us and without all of you. So again, um, I am so glad you were all here with us today. You can sign up to register for all of us at the link in the chat. You can also sign up to get this newsletter, uh, for our newsletter rather, to get an invite to the panel discussion and any up other upcoming events. This is our last one for the year 2024. We are taking a short break for the holidays and we will be back in 2025 to round out um, the the panel that we have three more coming up starting in the spring. So keep your eyes uh, peeled for those. Um, with that, I thank you for your time and have a great rest of your day.